Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, Notre Dame fans, whenever you are listening or watching today's show. Just really appreciate you guys for making us a part of your day here at Blue and Gold. I'm Mike Singer, uh, and my co-host is my sidekick, Kyle Kelly, talking some Notre Dame football recruiting on a Friday. A good Friday, as Lotus mentions. Um, so, yeah. Happy, happy Good Friday. I don't really know what to say, but good Good Friday it is. Good Friday it is. <laughs> Hello, Devin. Good to see you. Uh, Michael's in the chat as well. Uh, hope everyone is doing well. Uh, Kyle, I trust that you are doing well, my friend. Yes, sir. Just uh, preparing for a big day on Saturday. Hopefully a nice, easy Easter Sunday. And Notre Dame's keeping us plenty, plenty busy this month. What, what, what's busy for you tomorrow? Well, we have a commitment date, so we always got to be prepared for that. Anthony Saka, the four-star linebacker out of Philadelphia St. Joe's Prep. Big-time Notre Dame target set to come off the board. Okay. Kyle, your camera is, like, shaking. I don't know if you're pressing something, but your camera is going is going a little bit crazy. Uh, but, yeah, speaking of Saka, let's, 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 let's talk about him. Um, I didn't know if there was something else going on. Um, other than that, but yeah, Saka, um, a four-star linebacker from St. Joseph's Prep. Um, yeah, number 225 overall player, number 27 linebacker, according to the On3 industry ranking. Um, look, I I figured we have to talk about this. I don't really know what to say. Um, I mean, Notre Dame's been recruiting him for a really long time. Uh, he was offered by the Irish, I think, like two weeks after Freeman became the head coach. Like Notre Dame had offered less than 10 line or 10 players in the 2025 class. Um, you know, when, when he got, uh, you know, the scholarship, John McNulty and Chris O'Leary, you know, were the guys recruiting them. Um, of course, McNulty is now what tight ends coach, two tight ends coaches ago. And then O'Leary, you know, was recruiting him because Saka was the safety at the time. Um, so, yeah, he is announcing his commitment tomorrow. Um, you guys, you, you know, I, I, I don't really know what to say. Notre Dame's considered the heavy favorite. Um, and, and and I will leave it at that. Um, Kyle, do you have anything you want to add on that? Yeah, Notre Dame's certainly trending here in the uh, on three recruiting prediction machine. 95.6% chance of um landing his commitment but i just want to give a little bit of a context to you know why notre dame i i think leads for him i think pretty obviously um uh, you bring up his top five there um very interesting top five because anthony sack is a penn state legacy son of tony sack the former nittany lions quarterback but penn state's uh linebackers class is already filled up so they didn't make the list but these other four schools did uh, to my knowledge, Saka has never visited Wisconsin or Duke, so that kind of knocks them out of the race. Um, Alabama, he's been to once, but I don't really see Anthony Saka uh, going to play his high school football down in the south. And um, Ohio State uh, already has one linebacker come in, I think, and they're set to get possibly a second um, this week And TJ Alford. And from what I've heard, Ohio State was not ready to take Anthony Saka, so... I think that puts Notre Dame in a, a pretty good position um, to land his commitment when he announces tomorrow. And um, if he does end up picking the the Irish, as many folks expect, I think this is a uh, excellent pickup for Notre Dame. Yeah, he's I, – I, I don't agree with you about Ohio State. And Alabama, I think, is more of a contender than people realize. I, I, I think that all the schools want him. Um, pretty pretty badly and, and the Penn State thing like it, it really bothers me when Notre Dame do you remember the twins Jared and Jacob Smith last cycle the defensive lineman Notre Dame oh. wanted those guys for so long and then at the last minute Notre Dame stops recruiting on them and then they go elsewhere and everyone's like ah well Notre Dame didn't want those guys anyway that pisses me off because like everyone's like, oh, that's not a recruiting loss. We didn't even want them. Like, yeah, you wanted them for so long. And then you pull out at the last minute and everyone's like, ah, you know, 
uh, who, who who cares? We didn't want them anyways. Penn State, I don't care if their class filled up. Like they wanted Saka for a really long time, and, and they I, they just didn't get them. So I think you're downplaying the the job that Notre Dame's done here a little bit, Kyle. Just a little bit. No, I I'm I did not mean to downplay the job Notre Dame's doing because Al Golden has been pretty much like a staple in this recruitment ever since he got hired. I know Saka has told you that. He's told on three's Chad Simmons that like Saka's dad and Golden, they played together all four years at Penn State. And it wasn't just like they were on the team together. Like they have a really good friendship. And I think that kind of helped pave the way for, you know, Golden's relationship with Saka, obviously, um, just a little bit naturally. But he's done a great job. I, I know Max Bola has definitely been involved in this recruitment as a linebackers coach. So, I mean, Notre Dame's doing a tr- tremendous job here. I just am not as concerned um, by the competition as if there was a Penn State, you know, publicly in his top five or a Michigan or one of those types of schools. I think Notre Dame matches up pretty well with the other four schools that are finalists. It honestly is kind of a badass top five. Like, because you have, you know, like a Duke in there, but like, he has an offer from, like, he's got some elite offers here. I'm sure I'm sharing the wrong tab here. Georgia, Michigan, USC, Florida State, Oregon, Miami. Like, the whole, the non committable offer thing. Like, I hate getting into that because, like, they offered them. Like, it, if we're going to go by like, oh, was it committable or not? That's really subjective. And yeah, like the Jared Jacob Smith is kind of my perfect example on that. Like Notre Dame, one of those guys for a really long time, that was, it was a good offer, you know? So, so with, with that in mind, this kid's got an elite offer list and I love having like Duke and Wisconsin in there when you have Georgia and USC and all those schools. So, um, yeah, big fan of Anthony Saka off the field too. Um, I was scrolling back in my uh, my direct messages with him, and I had first started talking to him really around January 2022. So pretty soon after he got that offer, that's you know that's over two years. I don't like. I don't know if I've talked to a recruit you know with that big of a window before. Two years is a long time, and then you know when it's signing day and then when he enrolls um you know at a school it'll be summer of 2025 i believe he's a summer enrollee so that's you know now we're talking you know three and a half years i'll have known this kid before you know like as a recruit um before he gets to the school so yeah that'll be i don't know that's kind of a a side note um real quick mike Mike. yeah sure i i might have you beat there because i covered um Anthony Saka, it looks like February of 2022 uh, when I was covering Ohio State for Cleveland.com. So oh, when there see- we go. Kyle's Ohio State connections rearing up <laughs> again. No, I remember covering him back then because um, he was a safety recruit and he was a stud. Yeah. I mean, like you don't have the Notre Dames and Ohio State of the world offering you if you're a freshman in high school unless you're an absolute freak show. And that's what Anthony Saka is. He made the transition to linebacker last year. And I was watching some of his film this this morning just to kind of freshen up on on his game. And it's a really good football player. I think Notre Dame fans will be very happy um, if he does end up picking the Irish tomorrow. All right. Michael had a question here. Um, with the looming decision of Saka, um, on Saturday, and Notre Dame obviously in a very good position. If Saka does choose the Irish, does that leave one more at the end? I will probably dive into that um, more um, next week in, in kind of like an o- overview of the 2025 class. I'll look at each position, and I'm sure I'll do something about that at blueandgold.com. But my expectation would be – I don't know if you guys can hear my cat is just going crazy in the background. Um, very, uh, very big time operation over here. Uh, I think they would take up to five linebackers in the in the cycle if that um, if that makes sense. Um, so yeah, we'll we'll see. And 
I think really the names to know would be uh, Madden Fremo from California and then the the pair from from IMG Academy and Gavin Nix, who had a really good visit. We'll talk about him in a moment. Um, and then, of course, Nathaniel Owusu Boateng. Um, and, yeah, there, there's there's other guys as well. But the, the, there are many linebackers. But that's the, those are the three that, for me, that I would – that I would really um, mention. Noah McHale's visiting next week, I believe. Another one to keep an eye on, but I, I think he's probably going to end up um, at at USC. So we will we'll see on that one. Let's hear from our friends over at My Perfect Franchise, uh, and uh, we're going to ask you a few questions as we hear from our sponsor for the for today's show. And they are: Are you a displaced corporate executive? Are you wanting to put your career in your own hands? Or are you an experienced entrepreneur wanting to diversify? Well, Andy Ludicky can help you out. And he's a huge college sports fan and franchise veteran, having owned multiple franchises and businesses. Using Andy's expertise, he can help you find your American dream through a very thorough consultation and evaluation process. So give Andy a call. Put your life and career in your own hands. And best of all, his services are 100% free to you. So what do you have to lose? Find your perfect franchise at myperfectfranchise.net. Give Andy a call at 404-973-9901, myperfectfranchise.net. Greg says five. Seems like a lot, especially when Notre Dame plays five DBs. Uh, yeah, this is a good question. I think there's a few different things to look at with this. One, Notre Dame brought in four linebackers in the 2022 class. Uh, Burnham, uh, Tua Holomaka, Ziegler, and Sneed. Zero of those guys are inside linebackers. Zero. You bring in four, and zero of them are playing inside backer right now. Two have moved to the end. One transferred, and Sneed, you know, is more of that, um, you know, just versatile, you know, hybrid defensive end, you know, whatever that Jalen Sneed is these days, right? So that's a part of it, and I, I think Notre Dame's defense is continuing to evolve. Um, I, I was talking to a recruit today who, who mentioned, um, you know, he, he was being looked at as like a combo backer. I'm like, I, I, I feel like I keep hearing new things. The money positions is a new thing. There's, there's always something. So yeah, you, you stack linebacker, Kyle, we were hearing about hybrid, all this stuff. So like different terminologies that they're using, not necessarily like new terms and football or anything, but. Uh, I, I just think it goes to show that, like, yeah, the, the defense is evolving. You could have, of this five, I mean, like a Hulak, I, I feel like we could see ending up as a defensive end or Kookia. Um, So, and I think it would also be a situation where if they take five, um, it's because you're not turning down, you know, like a, a Nathaniel Lusa Boateng or, or, or Madden Fremo. It's interesting because I see this co this comment a lot um, from Greg, um, or like th th this comment that Greg is posting. I see this a lot about the linebackers. Tim talks about this on our Wednesday show. He's like, "Why, you know, why is Notre Dame taking so many linebackers when you know they they only play two on the field?" I'm like, "This is the only time I ever see this. This is it. At every other position, it's like take as many as we, you you can. Let's you know, let's take 18 offensive tackles, even though you can only play two. Um, so." Yeah, I don't know. It, it it's a situation where they're just gonna be taking too many, like just too. It's too many good football players. That's not really a a problem, there, is it? So that's that's kind of my thoughts on that. If you if you if you had anything to add, Kyle. Yeah, I was starting to kind of think about this last night. Um, as one does, the, <laughs> as how the linebackers class could come together, but. The reason I'm not concerned with a, a bigger defensive class in the 25 cycle because Notre Dame's probably going to lose a lot of guys on defense um, after this season. Now, ironically, linebacker is the youngest group um, on the defense, but, I mean, you think about Clarence Lewis, Benjamin Morrison, Xavier Watts, Rod Hurd, um, Riley Mills, Howard Cross, R.J. Oban, like all those guys, they're going to be gone there's naturally going to be guys that are going to transfer out. Yeah, there'll be some that, that transfers in. But I know this is something that you reported on probably about a month ago now, but 
you know, you did some reporting um, after talking to some people at Notre Dame, and basically their stance was, if our recruiting class is bigger, so be it. That just means we'll take less transfers. Um, you know, obviously it's got to be the right guys in the recruiting class. Like they're not just going to take guys that take guys. But if you got a Madden Faremo or Nathaniel Wusu Boateng, like you said, those guys want to come in. You know, you don't you don't tell them no because of a numbers game. And everyone always, I think that the numbers game is always a little bit too blown out of proportion. It always ends up working itself out. So that's not um, too big of a concern when you start to dive into it a little bit deeper. Greg, Adler, I think Notre Dame needs more players at safety, which seems even thin with it. Like I, someone was messaging or, or commenting on the message board this week about like, how can you criticize the coaching staff when they know much more than you guys? I'm like, I get that point, but at some like, like these guys are not infallible, you know. Like they they make mistakes, and sometimes like I I was never like a, a the biggest like Tyler Buckner fan. Goolsby was. And does that make me smarter than Goolsby? No, but I will say, when it comes to roster management, like this seems they know what they're doing they have a plan like that this is one where like roster management scholarship numbers like when notre dame's at 90 scholarships everyone's losing their mind like guys they're, they're gonna get to 85 it's, it's gonna be fine like they know what they're doing so roster management's one thing i am i'm not i would let them let them cook they usually will have a have a pretty good plan so um uh, yeah how much longer are we going to see 85 scholarships as well? <laughs> by by the time some of these guys come in, that 85 number could look different the way things are trending. Kyle, the, the thing about the past 12 months, all of the different things that have been going on in college football, I have n- I, I think that was also a thing. It's like, oh, they're gonna do away with that, or it was gonna increase to hundred. I have no idea. Is, is that is that something new? I, I don't know. I just know it's been talked about. Okay. Um, in- that number so it's always a possibility <laughs> yeah I, I just can't believe we, we we're moving to a 12 team playoff just to go to 14 before 14. we even started 12 before we even started 12 we're already moving to 14 in two years this it, it, it's fascinating it's fascinating i really apologize i've said this so many times but notre dame stealing mike denbrock not even being in the top 100 most interesting things that happened this offseason is um is it, it, fascinating to me matt says what do you think of the new well this is really not a recruiting question matt but i like it what do you think of the new kickoff rule in the nfl is that something may come to college in a few years i know recruiting show sorry you're good matt appreciate the five dollar super chat have a happy easter um you as well my friend um i don't care I, I really don't i get it like it's um it's football there's always been kickoff but I, you know I don't really care about the kickoff. It can go away. They can just start it at the 20 or 25 each time. Uh, if it goes well in the NFL, then I would assume it'll probably come to the college game. So, yeah, the kickoff is going to look weird. It's going to take some getting used to, but I personally don't even care if they do away with the whole damn play. Yeah, I think the what we've seen with college football recently, I, I don't know how, how many examples I can give here, but college football ends up um, – following the NFL with, you know, a good number of the rules. Now, some have come taken longer to implement than others, such as the uh, helmet communication. I think that's being uh, brought to college football this year. That's been around for over a decade in the NFL, I believe. Um, You know, obviously college football last year just stopped um, the stopping of the clock after first downs, which uh, the NFL does not – does not do so you know they let the clock run i so i would not be surprised if the uh kickoff uh, model in the nfl made it to college football but i don't see that happening soon because from what i've heard about the reporting on that nfl um the change in kickoff is they're going to let that go for a year and then they're going to evaluate it after the first season and i know a lot of people have compared it to the xfl model which it's pretty comparable i mean that's that's kind of the expectation, but I think they're going to tweak it as well. Um, but the other thing I like, it, it's, it is going to make games much more exciting. Uh, I think you saw this right away. Soon as the, um, 
the kickoff model was introduced, the Pittsburgh Steelers went out and signed Cordero, Cordero Patterson, who holds the uh, most kickoff return touchdowns out of any player in the NFL right now. Uh, so I think teams are you know, going to really covet those uh, kickoff returners. And don't be surprised if uh, next year Jaden Harrison, the uh, Notre Dame kick returner, is going to be a, a coveted commodity once he uh, ends his time in college football. Yeah, maybe Devin Hester will come out of retirement. He's he's like 50 now, but I'm kidding. But is, so is this supposed to make kickoff returns easier? A little more exciting. Yeah, I think it's because the way it was now, um, the touchback was pretty much the default. I mean, most of the time these guys were taking, taking the touchback as the option, better field position. But I think this um, – yeah, so it, maybe, they pushed it back too. Like I, I really haven't followed. No, I don't know for exactly when the uh, uh, where they're going to place the ball on the touchback. But um, yeah, I think this this new kickoff model encourages returns, and it's supposed to make it a little bit safer as well. Okay, uh, Matt, appreciate the uh, five dollar super chat. I, I, I would, uh, my personal opinion is, if it goes really well, I would see the college game adopting it, like in twenty twenty five, like. It, yeah, if the NFL loves it, it's going great. I, I I think that college would change it pretty quickly. But also, it's the NCAA, so who the heck knows? Uh, it's not like it's the you know the most consistent you know governing body that makes a whole lot of sense. So, anyways, so I wanted to move into talking about some midweek visitors. I mean, there was since last week's show, Notre Dame had that huge visit weekend. We're not gonna dive into all those guys for the sake of time, but I mean. You know, you can follow us at blueandgold.com and, and read all of our reporting. But I did kind of want to go through some of the midweek visitors that I thought were were fairly no, notable. And I think all of them, all of them were for the most part. Uh, we, we mentioned Gavin Nix earlier. You know, I wrote at blueandgold.com how good I was feeling about uh, him after his visit. You're the one who talked to him, though. Um, you know, I was just hearing that from sources. But I was, I was curious what what your vibe is right now on, on uh, Gavin Nix. Yeah, it's a uh, tricky recruitment to read because when I talked to Gavin Nix, I pretty much asked him up front, like, do you have a leader in this recruitment now? Do you have a top group of schools? And he said um, pretty, you know, pretty confidently to me that he's not even going to start rank ranking schools um, until after he gets done with all these spring visits. So that, that was kind of interesting to me. I'm sure he has a top group in his head, but he did not re reveal any of those to me. But what really stood out about my interview with him is he was telling me how when he met with Marcus Freeman, he told him that when he was scheduling his spring visits, Notre Dame was the first school that he wanted to see intentionally. Um, and that was the, the biggest priority for him this spring was to get to, to South Bend for a visit. So right there, I think that, um, you know, kind of stands out. Uh, Pretty well, and I'll go back to this is something I brought back up on the loose emoji message board earlier this week. Uh, when I talked to Gavin Nix back in September after I saw him play in Indianapolis last fall, I put on the message board, this recruitment reminds me a lot of Jalen Sneed, um, Kingston Villiamuasa, Jay Nosberry, three guys um, that are all from the South, and Kingston Villiamuasa, Asa's case, Southern California, but still the South, if you want to get real technical. But, um, you know, I, I think with the reason Osbury and Snead are a little bit different, they're right there in SEC country as is Knicks. But the big theme here was that Marcus Freeman won all those recruiting battles. And I know you brought up a few more names on the loose emoji message board, but I think there's always, there has been under Marcus Freeman, one surprising linebacker commitment since he's been the defensive coordinator or head coach. And this is one that I think it could be in the 25 cycle. Yeah, I like it. I like it. So he's at, he's at IMG Academy, but a lot of kids that go to IMG come from different states. He is a Florida kid. Um, so he's got Florida, Miami, Florida State, look to be the biggest competition. I mean, this, just looking at the visits, he's reportedly visited. Florida nine times, Miami six times, and Florida State five times. And there's just Notre Dame once last spring, and then once this spring, two trips compared to nine 
nine at Florida. That's that's kind of wild. Um, so I, I I think that. Um, but even with that in mind, I think Notre Dame's got a really good shot with with, with Gavin X, and I'm in complete agreement with Devin here. He says I th- I think we have a better shot with him than Nathaniel Lusu Boateng. Um, yeah, I think that recruitment is just very crowded and just very busy. I think Nick's. I think Notre Dame has a better shot with him um, than a, a lot of people think, um, like right now and. Um, and I still like where the Irish are at with with Boateng, uh, uh, Usu Boateng, for for what it's worth, especially after his January visits. Um, moving along, Brandon Finney. Um, I don't believe we've been able to catch up with him yet. Um, heard his visit went well. He you know, there, there's discussion behind the scenes about receiver or defensive back. What does he want to play? Um, you know, Notre Dame has been recruiting him at receiver, but. Uh, my understanding now is that you know he's um, very interested in uh, playing defensive back at the next level. Uh, so, does he? You know, what, like what? What does he want to play? Is Notre Dame okay recruiting at defensive back? How does that board shake out? So th- these are kind of the questions going on behind the scenes. But Penn State always does well at McD- McDonough School in Maryland, but Notre Dame, I am told is one to really keep an eye on with him. And then uh, Raiden Vines Bright from uh, IMG Academy was on campus. Uh, haven't caught up with him yet. Uh, good visit. I, I, I don't think that Vines Bright's going to end up at Notre Dame, though. Um, I did, you know, when Notre Dame first started recruiting him, vibes were really high. Kyle, know you talked to him. But I don't right now anticipate vines bright I, I i don't know well if, if he officially visits in the summer like it, it's scheduled i think that the irish um you know like all bets or are, are, you know are off kind of deal but uh right now my guess for this prospect from arizona currently at img i think that he ends up elsewhere but we'll see uh darren akinabon uh hillside new jersey defensive end uh w- was on campus and he um, it's considered a Georgia lean. That's still probably m- my guess right now. Good visit. Uh, Notre Dame would love to have them. Uh, they're very, um, picky right now for def- defensive linemen that they're continuing to recruit on top of what they have, but a Kinnabon would be one that they would like. Uh, but not, I don't think either of us have been able to, talk- I, I, I haven't talked to him yet. I don't know if you've been able to talk to Kinnabon since his visit, but um yeah that that's kind of the rundown on him uh and then we'll move over to a a 2026 prospect um from michigan gregory patrick top 100 overall player kyle i know you were uh you know pretty impressed with him when you got to talk to him yeah he he was pretty impressed with notre dame uh visited notre dame uh three times before he got back to campus this march after Notre Dame offered him on Pot of Gold Day. So he's visited Notre Dame four times. And I don't think he's visited any other school more. I think maybe Michigan State might have the edge there. He's a Michigan State legacy, I believe, so that's something to watch. But he's really high, really high on Notre Dame. I think Notre Dame is a top three school for him right now. Um, You know, one thing that stuck out to me that he said in our interview is, he wants to get back down to campus in April with the rest of his family and or um, his coaching staff at his high school, which is in the Kalamazoo area, um, just about an hour or two north of South Bend. So he's he's pretty close to campus there. And I think, Mike, as you know, anytime you know a recruit's talking about making a second trip in that short amount of time and bringing more people um, important to them, uh, bet you know with them on that next trip usually that's a pretty good sign but I did not get the the sense that you know he was considering a commitment right now but I think anytime as you know Mike with these offensive linemen they handle things a little bit different so would not be surprised to see uh Patrick come off the board and if you're an offensive lineman that Notre Dame's recruiting like you know the proof is in the pudding like all these guys want to want to come play football for Notre Dame. So I don't think Joe Rudolph has got to do a a ton of legwork in a lot of these recruitments because 
Uh, just, you know, even Patrick is one guy that told me right away, just, you know, their reputation speaks for itself. So uh, I think this could be one guy racing to claim his spot in the uh, 26 class. And he's a guy that I think Notre Dame's got a really good shot with. I right, move along. Troy Hun from Southern California. Um, he is, uh, it's an interesting one because so much of our talk um, has been about uh, Noah Grubbs and Brady Hart with regards to, um, you know, where the Irish are at, you know, w- w- with 26 quarterback recruits. But Hun was on campus Wednesday. Um, I wrote the article. I have not been able to proofread it and, and, and hit publish. I will do that soon after the show today. So you, you can check out what Hun had to say um, about the trip um, at bloomgold.com soon. But the, the sense was it was a good first visit, but this he, he, like, he is not close to being done with his recruiting process. Whereas, you know, when Grubbs visited, I think that he kind of, because while Grubbs visited last Saturday, and I guess we're kind of just moving into our next topic, which is, you know, just just quarterback recruiting in general for the Irish in 2026, which has been a hot topic for us at Blue and Gold. When Grubbs visited, there was a sense for him about Jared Curtis committing to Georgia. That happened while Grubbs was, was, was there. And like, oh, like, guys are committing. Like, I, I really need to think about this. In a perfect world, these kids decide exactly when they want to decide. Um, but oftentimes it's, you know, other quarterbacks, you know, will will make their move. Domino will fall and then, you know, kind of forces your hand. And that's actually something that Deuce Knight told me he talked to Noah about and the Notre Dame staff did as well. Like, you know, the ball's kind of in your court kind of deal. And the ball's going to be in Brady Hart's court when he visits Notre Dame uh, this upcoming Wednesday, I believe it is. The four-star quarterback from, uh, you know, Coco, Florida, or Coco High School. Um, so, yeah, he, he's another impressive player, four-star prospect, nine number nine quarterback in America. Grubbs is number 10. Oh, this is all per the on-three entry ranking, and then you got Hunt is five. It's a really good quarterback class in, in 2026. Uh, Notre Dame really uh, can't go wrong uh, with a lot of these guys. Um, so... Yeah, um, my gut remains to be that Notre Dame's going to end up landing Hart. Um, it's the guy I logged the prediction for a couple weeks ago. And, um, yeah, uh, I, I'm, I'm rolling with the Irish to land him. Uh, Grubbs, though, it, it very well may, may be the guy. I, I could absolutely be wrong here, and it could end up being Grubbs. Um, my sources believe that as well, but... You know, Notre Dame is very, very happy with its 2026 quarterback board and where things stand. But, you know, there's a there's a scenario where Grubbs ends up at, you know, getting Bama. This I think he's at Bama right now, maybe. Um, maybe he gets the Bama offer and he wants to go there. Or, you know, I've been told to watch out for Michigan for Noah Grubbs. So there's a scenario where Grubbs ends up elsewhere. Then Hart, he's a, his, his parents both went to Florida. So he could end up with the Gators or he could take his recruitment farther you know, down the line than Notre Dame's comfortable with. And then the Irish are in a good spot because they have Brady Schmeigel on the board. Um, they have Troy Hunter, who we just talked about. Um, you know, Ryder Lines is still out there. So the I, I think that Notre Dame's done a pretty good job building out this 2026 board. And I'll stick with my point from last week. I just don't really see a whole lot of urgency for a commitment at this rate. And if I'm with if I'm one of these guys, I probably want to see how some of these teams play um, this season. You know, Michigan's you – now granted they elevated Sharon Moore. The offense should be the same, but it's be a whole new regime there. New starting quarterback. I mean, Notre Dame, brand new offense, brand new quarterback. Um, Alabama, they got a new quarterback um, and new, obviously a new offense down there. Who knows what's going to happen in Florida with Billy Napier? You know, is he going to survive this season? So there are there are a lot of moving parts uh, with a lot of these teams. So, you know, I, I wouldn't be surprised if uh, a lot of these guys start locking up their spots because these are some coveted, you know, coveted vacancies that these teams have at the 26 quarterback spot. But 
you know, as I did say, I don't, if I'm one of these recruits, I don't know if I'm going to be racing to commit before my junior season. And and that's fine, but, you know, then you, you might have to just end up picking UCF, you know, like if, if, if you're okay rolling the dice, then, you know, you might end up at a school that you was not your first or second or even third choice. So, you know, it's, it's, it's just a risk that you, you got to roll with, which is very wise for, it's very wise for recruits to pick a school based that you could, like you would want to go if you're just a student, right? Um, you could get hurt the first day of, of practice, then what? Or your coaches can change, right? You got to, so you got to love the school, um, what I think is very important. You know, Steve Angeli is on his third offensive coordinator in three years. Um, heck, the tight ends, this is another new tight end coach, uh, McNulty to, I mean, Parker was there for a couple of years, but then Denbrock, like, Three uh, Joe Alt had a new offensive line coach every year. I mean, it just keeps like some of these spots. It just knew, knew, knew. Um, so you gotta love the school that you're at. You gotta love that culture um, because coaches can change. And I think that's something that recruits know. Um, but you know, actually putting it into practice, it can be a whole different discussion um, because you know a lot of them just don't believe that their coach would leave. And then what happens? They end up leaving. So um, so that's it for quarterback talk. I still like the Ashland Brady Hart, but I really could see it being Grubbs. Um, and then, yeah, there's the others um, as well. So, yeah, Matt just posted Super Chat. How Grubbs versus Hart, are their games similar? How's those recruitments going? Yeah, so that, that just kind of broke down the recruiting process for both of them. Um, Hart. You know, Florida's one to watch, and he's got a few other spring uh, visits scheduled. Um, and Grubbs, yeah, I think Notre Dame, Michigan, now Ohio State, Bama. If, if Bama offers, that's one to watch. But I think the Irish are, are definitely out in front for Hart. Uh, the their games are their games similar? Yes, I think so. They're both really good pocket passers. They're both tall. Six Hart's six five. You no know, Grubbs is solid six four. Uh, you know, Hart's a little bit leaner right now. Um, both move well, really good in the pocket, just like really solid modern day quarterbacks. Um, certainly, um, you know, among the top 10 in the country. Yeah. And, and as you mentioned, I mean, both these guys, bigger guys, and I think that's what Notre Dame's been going after lately at quarterback. Um, guys that are well over six foot, six foot two. Uh, so I just want to, you know, bring up their stats. Both guys playing Florida, Mike. I don't know if you know the classifications that they play in by chance. Yeah, I know they change. The classifications change since I live in Florida. <laughs> they should just be us one through seven, but now there's like two M. I don't know what the heck two M means. I think Brady Hart's team's two M, but co- they're they're long way to say they're both high classifications in Florida, like big big populations for those high schools. So we'll call it comparable competition. Yes. Uh, and uh, I'll start with Grubbs. So last year in 12 games, he completed about 58% of his passes for 3,670 yards, 49 touchdowns, and 10 interceptions. He's not much of a, a rushing quarterback, only 14 carries for eight yards, but did punch it in the end zone four times. So. Sounds like that Lake Mary offense. They'd like to use him uh, closer to the goal line there and get him in the end zone. As for Hart, um, he led his team to a state championship. 15 games, completed 65% of his passes for 3,759 yards, 41 touchdowns, 11 interceptions. Um, You know, pretty comparable rushing stats. I mean, 44 carries, two yards. So um, I don't think either of these guys are like your Riley Leonard that are going to be real dangerous with their legs. I think you're probably looking at two guys that are more traditional quarterbacks, but um, I mean, those guys, both, both sophomores there in Florida. I mean, Mike, you know, that competition down there, that's to, to have those stats um, against uh, you know, some, some really quality teams are, 
are, are pretty encouraging. All right. We just had a little breaking news on the side. Clarence Lewis has entered the portal. Is that a surprise? Uh, that's, that's a surprise, right? Yes, because Benjamin Moore, Benjamin Morrison just had shoulder surgery. So, you know, yeah, when he does return, like, is he going to be back? Um, that's, you know, as we learned all too well with Cam Hart, you know, those shoulder injuries can be nagging for sure. I think we all expect Benjamin Morrison to be at full strength, but by the time week week one rolls around, but still, I mean, and then, you know, you have a battle at that second quarterback, quarterback spot with Mickey and uh, uh, Christian Gray. And then at nickel, um, yeah, it's Jordan Clark that probably has that position locked down, but I mean, Clarence Lewis, he, although, you know, he did have some tough games earlier in his Notre Dame career, he's a pretty valuable part to that defensive backfield. So I can't imagine this is a guy that Notre Dame's, he, you know, going to be able to sleep easy at night about about leaving because I think he was a really valuable part to that defensive backfield. Yeah, I, I'm with you. This, it, you know. I, I, I rip rip Jules. I really hate this comment. Silu more like C like I I think it's terrible. Like I I, I think it was actually like a, a really like a, like a solid you know the piece of that defensive backfield. You know here let's pull the scholarship chart. Um, I mean you, you just Morrison has a shoulder. Chance Tucker's not you know not, hasn't really come together as a player yet for Notre Dame. You got Clark, Zanickel, you know, like it's Gray is a solid player. Obviously it's not like it's a super deep corner room right now. Um, yeah. Who knows when Morrison's going to be back uh, and Notre Dame likes to rotate their corners. Um, so yeah, I mean, he's a guy with nickel experience with outside uh, and, and I, I, I don't know. I really, I, yeah, I, I, I don't, I don't like the, the, the jokes, but anyways. Um, so it, yeah, they, it, it's an interesting, it's an interesting, uh, you know, move here for, for Lewis, especially with the timing of the Morrison injury. I don't think we're shocked that Lewis hit the portal. I think it's more of the timing is in when is the portal open? Um, I mean, so I think it's April 15th, but he's a grad transfer, so he can do it whenever. I think that's the rule, correct? Yeah, so I don't I don't know if he's a grad. I mean, I can imagine he is. Yeah, he's got to be. So, yeah, grad transfers can hit at any time. And then I think sometime in April, there's like a 14-day window that opens up. Okay, so um, that's that. Um, yeah, Rip Jules, uh, yeah. Oh, all, all, all good. All good, dude. Anywho, uh, did want to wrap up with one more topic of discussion here. Javon Boggs um, decommitted from Ohio State. Notre Dame had offered him, I want to say about a month ago. Um, and he's committed to the Buckeyes. And the feeling was, hey, if Notre Dame gets Brady Hart, Hey, maybe the Irish can flip this young man. Well, now now he's just decommitted from Ohio State, just opened up his recruitment um, altogether already. Uh, so hold on, I need to respond to Jack Sobel and just tell him, hold on, guys, hold on, give me a second. No, we are doing a show. Sorry, guys, we are a um, lot, lot of lot of different things happening at once. Uh, so Boggs and I, I wrote this at Blue and Gold this week. Boggs told me that. He is not visiting with Brady Hart. That was being discussed, um, but he's looking to get to South Bend soon. So it would be really interesting if, if, if Brady Hart does commit to Notre Dame and then you know his first phone call, uh, or maybe it's not even a phone call. It's just seeing Boggs, you know, at the, the, the Coco High School uh, hallways, uh, just trying to get his buddy to join him at Notre Dame. Uh, yeah, Florida is, is definitely a factor. Um, and, and had been for a little while. He's visiting Georgia this weekend. That's definitely notable. Um, so Florida, Georgia, and, and I know there's a few other teams that Missouri, I believe, was one that you know Boggs has been communicating a lot with. 
But uh, there's something about Notre Dame here that uh, I, I think that the Irish are going to become a pretty big contender here. If they're able to get Brady Hart, I mean, look, Boggs was named Mr. High School uh, or, or Mr. Football, excuse me, in the state of Florida um, by an outlet. He had a tremendous uh, junior season. I mean, just put up some bonkers numbers. Uh, I don't have it in front of me. Um, so, yeah, uh, Javon Boggs. Potential visitor for Notre Dame, Ohio State decommit, and uh, one to keep an eye on. Just wanted to cover Boggs um, in that news before we signed off today's show. So, Kyle, anything else that you you'd want to add before we before we end the show? Well, I had Brady Hart's stats handy, so as a Coco uh, player, I was able to bring up Javon Boggs' stats up pretty easily as well. So. Last year, he caught 93 passes for damn near 1,500 yards and 23 touchdowns. That's insane. Is that good? Uh, that's, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's pretty darn good. Again, and, 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 and good ball, too, in the, in the sun, Sunshine State. Um, so, yeah, that's going to wrap up today's show. If you're just joining us, uh, we started the show talking about um, Anthony Saka. Um, he's announcing a commitment tomorrow. He's got Notre Dame, Bama, Ohio State, Duke, Wisconsin on his final five list. We talked about some midweek visitors, and then we talked about Notre Dame quarterback recruiting in the 2026 class. So we're going to sign off today's show right there, folks. Really appreciate you tuning in. We will be back next Friday. Thank you all for watching, and as always, we will catch you next time.